Welcome to the show. Great to be here. I think most people who know you know you from election night. That's you are a superstar on election night. You work uh, the map. Uh, you were often very frazzled. And we actually cut together a <laughs> highlight reel. Uh, this is from a special election okay. in, uh, in Pennsylvania in 2018. Let's yep. take a look. Casey, I have to stop you. Steve Kornacki has a piece of paper in his mouth. Steve, I keep wondering if you're looking for my attention. Uh, do you, okay. Pen, pen. Okay. I can, yes, I, I, we we're going to just, let's go to math class. You probably got to get, let's say you got to get 1625. 1625. It's early morning. You're awake with me. How exciting is this? We've got an election coming down to absentees in Washington County, Pennsylvania. We all get to watch it together. Very enthusiastic. It's a joy to watch. Thank you. And of course, I uh, couldn't help notice one of the things that was making that night particularly hard, uh, you had a cast on one of your hands. Uh, was, that was a recent injury, yes? The day before that, or two days before that, I had gone over the handlebars on a bike. So that was, I had a broken hand, and I had to go to surgery about 10 a.m. the morning after that election. So we were up till 5 a.m., waiting for the final votes to come in. I had no sleep, and then I went to surgery as soon as I got out of there. Uh, well, you did a fantastic job. Yeah, Wait, it was a, way to play through night. the injury. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm really enjoying uh, your impeachment podcast. Uh, you both sort of fill everybody in, on, you know, because, again, there's just, like, a new uh, name, a new face every day. Uh, you give us context as to who these people are. You also give historical context. How is this comparing right now to the uh, Clinton impeachment and the Nixon impeachment? Yeah, I mean, just if you look at the politics of it, I think there's a stronger comparison to the Clinton impeachment 20 years ago than to the Nixon one. And I say that because of it, polarization. It's that word we use all the time, right? The parties being so dug in. When you look back at Watergate, the Nixon impeachment drive, what you saw was every new development, every new revelation, public opinion moved with it. So, you know, support for impeachment started very low. It started very low in both parties in 1973. By the summer of 74, when Nixon resigned, there was overwhelming support, about two-thirds majority in the polling. Even among Republicans, there was support for impeachment. So you look at that and you compare it to today, and, and still, you know, Democrats are almost universally in favor of it. Republicans are almost universally opposed. You just see polarization right now in the, in the numbers on this. And so now, of course, starting tomorrow, uh, we're going to see the first of our public hearings. Uh, Democrats, I should start by saying Republicans have been uh, clamoring for this to be brought into the public. Democrats have allowed it to be brought into the public. Uh, the idea being that maybe this will tip the scales more. Yet with this polarization you're talking about, it strikes me as very unlikely there will ever be, should this go to the Senate, that there will ever be uh, enough Republican senators willing to switch sides to impeach the president. Is that your thinking as of now? I mean, politicians follow the polls. One of yeah. the reasons we're always putting the polls up there is because they guide the actions of politicians. And if you're a Republican politician right now and you're trying to make sense of what's going on in your own party, remember, if you lose a primary, you lose your job. And I think they see their party almost universally, as I said, behind Trump, almost universally against impeachment. You think back to the 2016 campaign, Donald Trump won that nomination in 2016, basically going around all of these Republican elected officials. He didn't have a single endorsement from a Republican in, in Congress until he won the New Hampshire primary. And I think that delivered a very powerful psychological message, really, to Republican members of Congress that, wow, they would say, our voters, our people, the people who elect me are with him. I better be, too. There isn't there also an argument, let's say it never is going to lead to him getting uh, removed from office, but that bringing these public, you will then have to uh, force politicians to choose a side and be on the record for, uh, for history as where they landed, especially as more and more comes out. And, and the things that they said a month ago, look, if it was this, I'd feel differently. And then this happens. And they're like, no, and now it's got to be that. And then that happens. And they're like, guys, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, isn't there some value in that? Well, yeah, I think there is a political angle on it, too, just in terms of, sure, there's a lot of Republicans. Lindsey Graham, I think you might be referring to right there. Sure. Lindsey Graham's got to run for re-election next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His big challenge in South Carolina is the Republican primary. But there are other Republican senators uh, Susan Collins in Maine. Maine's a blue state, right? Maine's a state that went for yeah. Hillary Clinton. Cory Gardner in Colorado, blue state. They've got to balance the demands of the Republican primary with, hey, I got to win a general election too, and that could be close. And I think those are the ones, if this does get to the Senate, if this does become a trial, they've got the trickiest political calculation to make because on the one hand, they don't want to anger that Republican base, get a primary challenge. On the other hand, they could anger general election voters who don't like Trump.